Dunnington's an impressive chip. Uh, it is one of the larger chips Intel's ever made. Not as large as the uh, quad-core uh, titanium that's coming, but close. It's got six cores on it, and it's one single chip. This is the first time Intel's done a multi-core chip that has had all of the cores united as opposed to doing multi-chip kind of packages. So right. now a four socket system can have 24 cores, which is an incredible amount of computing horsepower. And because it's all unified, there's a common cache for all six cores. That means that if you have a task or if you have a workload that has multiple threads running simultaneously and they're working on common data, you can have a situation where the data that one of the cores needs is in the cache of another core and now all of that can be resolved completely on chip. In past Intel designs, when you had that kind of workload, you had to go out over a front side bus to resolve that cache coherency and that turned into a real performance bottleneck. So now with six cores and eliminating those bottlenecks, uh, this should be a very impressive chip from a performance standpoint. And even though it's a new chip, it fits into Intel's existing Caneland platform, which has been out for almost a year now, which means customers who went with the original quad-core version of Caneland can now go and take these new Dunnington-based systems uh, with minimum qualification time because basically it's the same platform. So this is going to be a very nice midlife kicker for customers who have already moved to that platform. Now if they didn't move to Caneland last year, uh, they may find that moving there this year, even with the impressive uh, piece of silicon in Dunnington, might be a lot of work for a relatively small gain since a year from now Intel will be introducing an 8-core version of its Nehalem processor uh, for four socket configurations and that will be really an awesome system. So now if you had to qualify the platform and you knew it was going to be a one-year kind of thing and you'd have to go through the whole process again, next year you might question whether you wanted to do it. But if you're already there, if you've got that platform established and you just want a nice upgrade, this should be a very attractive upgrade. There are still areas today where AMD has an advantage because its, uh, pro its prop platforms uh, with their integrated memory controllers have far more memory bandwidth than do Intel's. And so the combination of better bandwidth, lower latency, gives AMD advantages when benchmarks tend to be memory intensive. If the benchmark is processor intensive, uh, then often Intel will win. Last year, of course, it was almost a no-brainer because AMD didn't have their quad cores and consequently Intel, uh, even, or even without a quad core, AMD could just not really compete even with its architectural advantages against Intel's quad cores. So this year I think AMD has definitely closed the gap I don't expect AMD to really be ahead in terms of high performance uh, contests uh, for any time in the near future. Uh, AMD's roadmap over the next couple of years uh, is conservative. It shows that they want to stay in the game, that they want to be predictable, uh, but it doesn't, they don't have anything on the map right now that is going to give them the kind of advantage over Intel that they had uh, back in 2003 and 2004. A year from now, Nehalem will be there with eight cores. Uh, AMD will be there with a six core derivative of Shanghai. Uh, and uh, the, I think there too, again, because of the changes Intel's making with Nehalem, they're likely to have higher levels of performance. For example, Nehalem has 
not only an integrated memory controller, but three channels uh, of memory, whereas AMD right now has two channels. And so what has been for AMD a classical advantage, we have two controllers, they only had one. Suddenly Intel can say, we have three, they only have two. And those sorts of changes, uh, I think, uh, will give Intel some performance advantages. It's maybe one of the reasons why companies like DreamWorks, who have been working with AMD for the last four years, uh, announced earlier this year that they're planning to go to Intel uh, when the Halen chips arrive. AMD is regaining some of the momentum that it had last year because not everybody wants to pay the top dollar for the fastest chip. And in the mid-range, AMD is certainly uh, still competitive. Uh, it's just that uh, given the way AMD has structured its roadmap going forward, it won't be sometime until 2010 or 11 when it makes its next major architectural push uh, with what they've been referring to as the bulldozer core, that they will have an opportunity to leapfrog Intel. And in the meantime, Intel will have done, gone through several uh, enhancements to its architecture uh, with Nehalem, with Sandy Bridge, and I think uh, they've even extended their roadmap now into some 32 nanometer and 22 nanometer products. So Intel's always been a tough competitor. Uh, AMD uh, demonstrated that they had the ability to compete with Intel. I think they got a little off track last year, and uh, they're definitely I think uh, trying to get back on track this year. A year ago, I, <clears throat> I used to worry about that, that Nehalem was all new platform and processor, and therefore there was a lot of technical risk. But if you look at the way Intel is rolling Nehalem out with uni processor systems late this year, dual, pros dual socket systems uh, in early 09, and then uh, what Intel calls extended platforms for way and beyond uh, in the second half of 2009, uh, they have factored in a lot more time into the schedule for these more advanced configurations. So it does take longer to qualify these uh, complex configurations, and I think Intel's schedule reflects that. So at this point, I'm less worried about that there will be uh, some sort of technical problem that will have a schedule impact since there's plenty of time to resolve those, those technical problems.